First class is going away. Other than Emirates and Qatar, in the last year, every first class that I've been on has been nearly empty. Welcome to another adventure. Today we get to experience the flag carrier of Angola, tag Angola Airlines on their flagship aircraft, the Boeing 777 from their hub in Luanda, the capital city of Angola, to Sao Paulo, Brazil. One of the world's more unique routes, albeit one that's critical to tag success. I actually booked it as a continuing journey starting in Porto, Portugal, connecting through Luanda with a long layover. TAG actually decided to serve Porto with these 777s for literally only a handful of dates for the holiday season, and it made the journey significantly cheaper. I had to include the departure in this intro solely because of how absolutely stunning it was. As we climb away from the Portuguese wine capital and make our way south to Africa, let's talk a bit about who this airline is. TAG actually was founded about 85 years ago and had their first flight in 1940 as DTA, which is the acronym for the Portuguese translation on Air Transport Division, hence their ICAO code being DTA. The airline as we know it didn't come into existence until 1973 when Angola became independent from Portugal. It was also at this time that TAG was announced as the flag carrier of Angola. As a matter of fact, it looks as if their livery has looked the same since then, with the same red and orange colors and logo. If anything, maybe slight fine-tuning to the logo or font, but largely the same. In their fleet is a handful of 777s which have become their flagship aircraft, with the flagship interior in the works. Anyways, I'll save the details for once we climb on board as we arrive into Luanda, it's time for me to enjoy the city for a bit, and then we can continue to Sao Paulo. TAG also has Africa's only first class, which is an accomplishment in and of its own right regardless of its rank internationally. I say this, but there is a solid chance that we see a new one soon, as Air Cote d'Ivoire announced that their new A330neos will include a first class cabin. It would be truly incredible to see, although since announcing that aircraft and order and first class intentions, there's been no further update on that project. For now, all we have is the hope that it will one day come to fruition. This could be significant, however, solely because so many people travel to Africa using Qatar and Emirates so they can use first class services. If an African airline is able to build a proper and competitive first class product, they could corner a great market, providing not only the first service of its kind for people traveling to and from Africa, but also connecting to and from the southern hemisphere, since in the entire southern hemisphere there's only a couple first class products, all in Southeast Asia and Australia, and all of fairly small sizes, but nothing at all in South America or Africa. Welcome to Luanda International Airport, named February 4th Airport to celebrate their independence from Portugal. Full disclosure, considering my inbound flight was a daytime flight and my Sao Paulo flight is a nighttime flight, there will be a bit of a mix of footage from the two flights, just in the spirit of better lighting and camera angles. Once inside, there was all of the ticket offices, but then a ticket check as security was checking everyone's ticket in order to be let in to the check-in part of the terminal. Check-in was open for a bunch of European airlines, including Air France, TAP Portugal, and ours, TAG Angola, with a specific check-in lane for first-class travelers, which was completely empty. Business class had a heck of a line, and economy was insane considering in the next few hours there would be 777s departing to Lisbon, Madrid, and Sao Paulo. With our boarding pass, we pass through immigration and security before being in the terminal, where there's a couple gates upstairs and a couple downstairs. Upstairs, however, is where all the food and shops are, so that's where we headed off to. As we walked around, the paint on the walls up here was pretty cool as we made our way to the main courtyard of items. Most of the places to hang out is in this one main courtyard. In this area, there were no gates, only shops and restaurants. There's a few restaurants of local foods, as I guess the best thing about these small airports is that you won't find any chain restaurants. The shops that were open at this time had a whole lot of great souvenirs made right here in Angola. It's just that most of it was closed. We were also treated to live music from some local band that was pretty much all string instruments and one drummer. Back near the top of the stairs to this upper level is the TAG Lounge. 
Tag just has this one lounge. Unfortunately, this is just one of the examples that we will see first and business class passengers given the same experience. The lounge has two main rooms. Just past the bar is the buffet and most of the seating. The buffet was currently being swapped out at this time, which is why it looks a bit bleak at the moment. After restocking, there was a good selection of fresh and hot items, although I was asked to stop filming only part way through it. Here you can see the main seating area. There was enough seating for everyone despite being totally packed, including at the dining area adjacent to the buffet if you're looking for a better table to eat at. And at the back, there's a hallway to the restrooms, but also to the second part of the lounge. This part seems to be a bit more new, just based on the different seats and decor, which gives me hope for the future, since a new Angola airport is being built. If they apply some of the new design strategies to that airport, it should end up being a good place to hang out. I just hope it ends up in better shape than this airplane, which probably won't end up flying anytime soon. I grabbed some food from the buffet, the rice was bland, the chicken was as dry as ever, but luckily you can't really mess up cheese and olives. I did, however, spill my angle and beer all over the floor. Our boarding time was labeled as an hour and a half before departure, so I made my way out there to board. Typically, priority boarding is one of the perks you'd expect with first class, but today's was an adventure. In the lounge, one of the attendants came in to announce for all Sao Paulo passengers to head to gate 4. When I got there, there was a very long line of people for a boarding pass check. The problem with gate 4 is that, at least at the moment, it was for all TAG flights, so we had to wait for the Madrid flight to completely finish boarding so that we could board. Then the Lisbon flight had to wait for us to finish boarding before they started, which led to a slightly late boarding. There was a gate holding area, and they were checking boarding passes to let us in. I got to the front and was told that first class would board last, so that we didn't have to wait. I do think there's some merit to this, although they told me I could wait off to the side. I guess I more wished that they would have communicated it better so we could have stayed in the lounge instead of just standing next to the boarding counter. I will give a little bit of benefit of the doubt just because most of the announcements were in Portuguese, so it's possible that I missed some important information. After waiting there for a little over an hour, one of the attendants who spoke a little better English let me into the boarding area so I could at least sit down. Just as a heads up, there's no restroom in here, and since they've already marked you as boarded, they don't want you leaving, so make sure to use the restroom before entering the boarding area. Eventually, he took me downstairs to another seat. I was truly the last person to board, but that guy left, so there was a 10 minute period where I was alone downstairs, wondering if they had forgotten about me. Eventually, I was picked up by a private car. Heck of a win for Tag, best touch we've seen so far. It was nice to be in this air-conditioned vehicle after standing around for two hours in the terminal, which had to be like a thousand degrees. Everyone around me was all sweaty. As we drive out to the airplane, I'll say that if they're planning to continue with this boarding strategy in the new airport, my suggestion would be to either have first-class ground attendants that will come get passengers from the lounge when it's time for boarding, or, alternatively, a first-class lounge so that the attendant can just announce it to everyone in there so that everyone's ready for boarding at the right time. Up the stairs and onto our 777, you'll notice something important. TAG has actually begun installing a new first class product. It actually is a great looking product with seats like Kuwait Airways and Garuda, just without the closed doors. Currently, two of their five 777-300s have this new setup. Our plane today, unfortunately, does not. With that, welcome on board the older style of TAG's first class. A little tip when trying to book the new suites, the old setup, this one has seats A through J, the new setup has A through K. Originally I was booked in 2K, picked so we would have the new suite. I was hoping first class would be first class, so I guess we'll see what happens. At least we know they're building a new renovation, so I'm not going to get too caught up on the seat specifically, but speaking of the seat. Let's take a look around. These seats resemble the Asiana 747 first class. They don't offer a ton of privacy, but the privacy instead comes from having a private cabin. The seats themselves are like sitting in an old couch. They're comfy on that front, even if they're old. The headrest is large and has good cushion. 
It tilts and theoretically can fold at the edges, but most of them don't actually stay in place. The seat cushions all showed signs of age. Some were in better shape than others. Looks like their renovation is coming at a good time as far as the cabin wear goes. There is a reading light along the window side that can be adjusted in its angle and brightness. It does get in your way, however, when leaning to look out the window. The storage cubby along the window was incredible. I fit my entire backpack and still had more space. The only thing I'd say is that I'd prefer two or three smaller cubbies, since I actually left a couple things on board by accident. I think it might just be a little too big. The shelf along the window is huge, although they don't want you storing things there based on the signage, even though it seemed like most people did anyway. Along the armrest is a flap that hides the remote for the in-flight entertainment screen. It comes out with the push of a button and is double-sided with all sorts of controls and keyboard. Below that is a good selection of jacks for the entertainment system and for charging, in addition to a little storage slot. The seat controls are here as well. They've got some presets and a massage function, but if you watch my videos you know nothing hypes me up like being able to adjust the pieces individually. This large little counter was nice for holding phones, drinks, or anything else that wasn't huge. Its main purpose, however, was just hiding the tray table beneath it. The tray table comes out by pushing the button to release it, then swiveling it out. It's great size, more than enough for one person. Along the window is the literature pocket which houses the safety card and tag magazine. I gotta think they messed up by not naming it the tagazine. You gotta see the universal charging port here, you'll also notice that the light is red. When I boarded the plane in Porto, two of the 12 ports were inoperative. By landing, four of the 12 were inoperative, forcing me to actually move seats, which was easy enough considering I was the only first class traveler on this flight. I flew the exact same plane from Luanda to Sao Paulo. We eventually got down to only two charging ports working in the entire cabin, which forced me to move seats three times to keep charging, which drew some unwanted attention from the crew who ended up having the pilot come and reprimand me for moving seats in this empty cabin. In front of you is obviously the TV, which was theoretically touchscreen, as well as having the remote for it. The footrest was crazy far away unless you moved the seat closer. The biggest perk of the footrest being that it served as a second seat if you had a friend in first class with you. It also lifted up to give you better access to the little storage cavity below it. This cabin unfortunately was kept hot hot. I mean especially leaving Angola since we were at a remote stand with at least four doors open to the African summer weather for multiple hours. This wouldn't have been the end of the world except that there were no air vents and the air conditioning was intermittent. You could hear it rev up every 10 to 15 minutes and then die not long after. As mentioned earlier, I don't want to knock them too, too much since they're already renovating these cabins, but bro, these things are worn. I mean, every surface was broken or dirty. I wonder how long they think it'll be for all of the aircraft to be finished with their renovations. As far as the amenities for this flight, we were given this little pillow and this little blanket. I think I've had better bedding in some economy classes if I'm being honest. We were also given a pre-departure beverage for which I chose the sparkling wine and it came with these little cashews. And that was it. Those were all the amenities for this first class flight. Admittedly, I think I screwed myself by flying Emirates, Etihad, and Qatar first class earlier this year, but even Kuwait and Garuda first class had impeccable service and amenities. As I've mentioned, I think I've been given more in most economy classes. I mean, we didn't get any form of amenities, any form of headphones, any form of menus. But who knows, maybe I've just been lucky. Let me know what your thoughts are below. Now back to the nighttime in Angola as we prepare for departure from Luanda's remote stands. Um, actually, hold up. Is that a crack on my window? I alerted the crew, who said it was not a problem. For better or for worse, I took their word without knowing anything of the 777 windows myself, so here's to hoping it's just the inner panel and not required for any sort of pressurization. But hey, I guess I'm here with y'all now, so how bad could it really have been? As we prepared for taxi, I noticed an issue. The safety video was only playing on the middle TVs, not ours. The flight attendant actually asked me to move to the middle seat until the video ended playing. Once the video was over and I moved back to my seat, I got to thinking about how Africa's aviation market is definitely on the come up. 
Since COVID, many African countries have either been able to invest more money or seek out more investments to revamp their facilities. We've seen large growth across a continent that actually only holds about 3% market share of the global aviation market. Angola is now a part of this as well. A brand new state-of-the-art airport, not just terminal, but entirely new airport is set to open completely, hopefully sometime in 2024, with airlines slowly moving over from the current airport. A $3 billion project was commenced to build a new airport capable of catering to 15 million passengers annually. While I can't find any concrete data, it appears that the project's construction is being done largely by a Brazilian company and design and management being done by a Chinese company who even built a little Chinese village or Chinatown of sorts for their workers and employees, meaning that Angola seems to have brought in assistance from some of their closest financial allies to make this dream come true. It sounds as if the current Luanda airport will remain operational, largely for cargo and regional flights, but the new airport should be a spectacle. The airport is known as a white elephant of sorts within Africa, as one source stated, solely because the opening date has been pushed back multiple times. All kinds of exciting things, and not just for us passengers, but the government also seems to be excited considering they're increasing their push for tourism, passing a motion for a 90-day visa-free stay at at least 98 countries. Between that, the new airport, and the airline growth plans, I very much look forward to Angola's growth in the world. In the air, as always, I plan to investigate the in-flight entertainment system. Remember, the safety video wasn't working, so I was a bit skeptical as to what would happen. Sure enough, I got nothing to happen on the screen. I tried the remote and everything. No luck. I figured, no worries, I'll just move to a middle seat. You know, the ones that the safety video actually worked on? Still no joy. The purser realized this at one point and tried resetting it. No luck. I have to admit that on my flight from Porto, it was inoperative on the same aircraft, but my purser on that flight told me they planned to look at it while the plane sat for six hours or so before our flight to Sao Paulo, so I held out hope. So a total of 17 hours with no functioning TV. At least in Luanda, just in case, I downloaded some stuff on my computer. I think it kind of goes without saying as well, there was no Wi-Fi available on board TAG's flights. I also enjoyed the mood lighting that showed up on like two panels. The crew seemed to reset this as well, and then we were able to get some better mood lighting for our meals. They came by with our placemats with tag branding, another bag of those cashews we got before the flight, and a beverage of which I chose to go with a tea since I was planning on sleeping after the meal. Speaking of the meal, I mentioned that there was no menus. On the first flight, the purser made all the options, brought them to me, and then brought the two that I didn't pick up to the cockpit. On this flight, they just told me that there was one starter, and then fish or chicken for the entree. I decided to go with the chicken, and while they prepared that for me, I got my starter, which was a little side salad, bread, and this quinoa-type grain with shrimp with a little too much shell left on it. Still pretty tasty, and better presentation than any US and most European airlines. 
Then, the chicken entree. I had high-ish hopes since the starter was good and my meals on the last flight were super tasty. I mean, look at these things from the Porto catering team. Fruit and cheese plates, omelet and chicken skewer, melon balls and prosciutto, and a pork and rice dish. For the desserts, they even brought out a tray with like 10 options. Different cakes, fruits, cheeses, all that. On this flight, they just told me some things that were available, and it was a bit disappointing to have the inconsistent service, if I'm being honest. This chicken entree was unfortunately just not quite as good as the other tag meals I had. The chicken was dry and whatever this sauce was on top didn't help its case. The root veggies weren't bad, maybe a bit mushy, but not bad. Stuffed at this point, I bypassed the cheesecake dessert in favor of a fruit plate. You know I ain't taking a flight without munching on some serious fruit. One perk of the meal service was the engraved silverware. As is on this channel, we gotta give it some love. Then it was bedtime, but so as to not disrupt a dark cabin with one other person in it, let's pop back to the first flight where I was able to get some shots in the daylight. The seat's individual movement buttons aren't bad, but the presets were plenty for me today. First, taking this from a seated position to the relaxed position. I found it to be comfortable, although I've gone in favor of the ones that tilt the seat part of the seat back a bit. Then to the full flat position. I was skeptical as seats of this style typically only have the angled lie flat, but lo and behold, we did get it 180 degrees flat. The only thing against it, perhaps, is just that the leg rest doesn't entirely meet the foot rest. I also had concerns on the privacy, but we'll see that once we get cozy. The best thing about minimal bedding? Minimal effort to make the bed. To start, we'll just throw this pillow over there real quick. Then this little blanket. It's really more of a throw blanket, but as I mentioned, it was the temperature of Satan's butthole in here, so I guess we can do without a big comforter anyway. But there it is, the fully made bed, all in a matter of seconds. Can't argue with that. There is one thing you can argue with, however, the footrest. It had a couple flaws in bed mode. First off, that gap was perfectly where my heels were. Basically, on my back, my heels dug in, and on my side, my ankles dug in. In addition, the seat buckle isn't the most comfortable if you scoot down a bit. This one does have an easy fix as well by just unbuckling it. I would say that it's a bummer not to have a mattress pad, but like I mentioned, the seat's so worn in it's like sleeping on your grandma's couch. I only worried about cleanliness as the fabric looked considerably dirty in many parts. Lastly is the privacy. You'll see here that even in bed mode, you are pretty exposed to the rest of the cabin. This isn't exactly a fault of tags, as it was just a sign of the times of these seats. First class seats from this day focus less on individual privacy and more on the cabin privacy. With all that checked out, we're going to head back to our nighttime flight to Brazil, where I'm going to get some sleep, not before moving seats again so I can have a working charger as the one I was using stopped working during dinner. I'll check in with y'all after a quick nap though. Good morning, or night, or whatever. This is day 7 of this trip, flight number 12 existing in 10 different time zones. I honestly think my circadian rhythm just punishes me in other ways at this point. As always, a quick visit to the lav where there are no surprises. It's basic, not only white and boxy, but also no amenities. With no amenity kits, I may have given them some brownie points if they at least had lotions and stuff in the lavatory, but no. They do have cups in there, but no mouthwash and no dental kits. And you can't drink the water, so what are they for? Mid-flight urine tests or something? Fun, I guess. Before long, mood lighting came up and they prepared for our breakfast. Shortly before breakfast, however, the cabin crew must have had enough of me taking my little pictures and whatnot in addition to me moving to a seat with a functioning charging port because they had the pilot come out and give me a whole lecture about all kinds of stuff about safety and regarding the cabin crew and stuff like that. He was super nice about it, but it's the first time I've had three members, including a pilot, come up to me to ask me to stop filming, so I guess it's fair to say that TAG is very anti-camera. Or at least they said, unless I had approval for whatever that process is like. Once he found out I was a pilot, he also told me I should tell crew that I'm a professional pilot in case they need help with an incapacitated crew member. I nodded and agreed, despite knowing that in the US at least, it's kind of a running, cringy joke to go to the cockpit on boarding and tell the pilots that you're a pilot. After my TED talk, I was given another fruit plate, the starter for my breakfast. 
After that was like a quiche kind of thing. Not entirely sure, but it's egg based and it has toppings. It also came with peppers and potatoes. Still not as good as the first flight's meal, but significantly better than dinner. I guess Porto's catering game is just that strong. Just after dinner, we got our first sign of land as some of the Brazilian coastline's lights came into view. This meant it was time for descent, and that means we need to have a quick chat. This time, about Tag's future and a little about where they came from. We talked earlier about Tag as we know it being born just after the Angolan independence in 1973, but as far as just what it has become since then, it's typically found its life in two markets, the regional African market and the Portuguese market, for obvious reasons. They actually received a ban from EU airspace in 2007 that lasted for a couple years before they were given access specifically to Portuguese airspace. It took until 2019 for the ban to be lifted in its entirety, at which point they added Madrid to their network and launched a partnership with Iberia for better connections. On December 14th, they also added a three-time weekly service to London Gatwick, which has become a preference of new airlines to London due to the lack of and cost of landing slots at Heathrow. Rwandair, for example, began at Gatwick before moving to Heathrow not long after, once the route proved profitable enough to afford Heathrow slots, a tactic that's been used by many airlines recently. In 2016, TAG received its first 300 variant of their 777s, quickly becoming the flagship, and used mostly to Portuguese-speaking destinations like Lisbon, Sao Paulo, and Rio de Janeiro, now seeing more vacation destinations like Madrid and Johannesburg. They have now reached a total of five of these aircraft. Now we get to be excited for the future because TAG has been in the news with some of their projected changes. For starters, they've placed an aircraft order including A220s and 787s. This is somewhat of a surprise just because of their long-standing partnership with Boeing, although the A220s should prove very valuable for the airline in their regional African market. The 787 is coming in the Dash 9 and Dash 10 variant, being the first African airline with the Dash 10 variant. You may ask what they plan to use these aircraft for, since, if I had to guess, their current destinations will continue to see 777s due to the higher density. As for destination growth, we do have a slight glimpse into that plan. First off, Angola and China have a strong political and financial partnership, so they've looked into growing there. In previous years, they have flown to Beijing, but it also appears they've considered Changsha and Guangzhou. The CEO spoke a bit on this to say that Asian growth is slightly less likely for the airline, just due to the competition that it's not worth taking a loss to operate such routes and therefore will focus mainly on Africa, with South America as a secondary interest, not to mention Europe, now that the airspace ban has ended and the Iberia partnership has been doing some lifting as well. As a US citizen, I always have interest of new airlines showing face in my home country as well. TAG hasn't officially announced any routes or plans, but they have reportedly been working on getting their FAA Category 1 certification, a notoriously difficult thing for most airlines to get for their first time. Now let's play with the theoretical that they receive this rating and want to make use of their 787s. Typically, we'd see Atlanta or New York service due to high African concentrations and tourism, or Washington DC for political reasons. But the highest concentration of Angolans in America are in cities like Houston, Chicago, and Boston. Honestly, if they do add US service, once the new aircraft arrive, they could reach most places in the country, but my guess is they'll either join an alliance or partnership with a US airline and fly to a hub of theirs to get connecting traffic, since there are large proportions of Angolans in places like Phoenix, St. Louis, Philadelphia, and Oklahoma, places that won't likely see non-stop service to Africa. Whatever the growth ends up being, it sounds as if their intention is to add new countries to their route map, not necessarily cities, essentially choosing a new country over a second city in a country they already fly to. Exciting possibilities. Let's give it five-ish years and see what ends up happening, especially considering that their recent growth is a record since COVID, even recording a break-even or slight profit, it sounds like, for 2023.
Welcome to Sao Paulo's Gorulos Airport, where Terminal 2 is home to almost all South American flights and African flights, as Ethiopian Airlines uses Terminal 2 as well as TAG, as has Egypt Air and Royal Air Maroc in the past, if I'm not mistaken. It is smaller than Terminal 3, however, the main international terminal, slightly newer and more flashy. Now, as far as our thoughts, TAG has some parts that really work, so I don't want to be too critical. Perhaps the greatest reason is because of how tough the African aviation market is to thrive in, just simply because of its size. So until an airline truly reaches the international portfolio of something closer to Ethiopian, it's very hard to make a profit. It does sound like TAG has just about recovered from COVID, so maybe we will see some good growth from them. I also don't want to be too critical because most of the things in regards to the cabin and the airport are a moot point just because renovations are already underway, so I am excited to try those when the time arrives. I think the biggest thing we can differentiate is the soft product. Sometimes when airlines go through a big renovation, like a new airport and cabin, there's a chance they renovate the soft product as well, but more likely than not it'll remain the same or similar, so let's talk about it. First off, the only airport with additional services for first class passengers is Luanda. In both Porto and Sao Paulo, it was business as usual. That being said, the services at Luanda were mixed. For the most part, we had the exact same experience as business class passengers. The only differences I noted was a dedicated check-in line and a private car to the airplane which I must say was an incredible touch by TAG, especially at an airport with no jet bridges. Other than that, the airport experience doesn't lend a whole lot extra for the double cost you're paying from a business class passenger. Once on board, the crew was one extreme or the other. I'd say about half the crew was a little standoffish. They never smiled, and their interactions were very direct. I'll chop it up partially to the fact that I don't speak Portuguese, but with English being a worldwide standard, I'd expect at least a smile and a hello. Not to mention, the service just seemed a bit inconsistent. The other half were great. I had a great interaction with one crew member on my first flight, talking about how she learned English from YouTube and wanted to practice it. On my second flight, when they had the pilot come tell me to stop recording, he was super nice about it, especially once finding out that I too was a pilot. Now the soft product on board is where I feel like TAG really suffered compared to other first class products in the world. I've flown a handful of first class products and there were a few major things missing here that they may look to improve in the future. Amenity kits, menus, a la carte dining, free Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi of any sorts, slippers, and actual bedding. I mean, United Economy gives the same level of bedding we saw on this flight, plus headphones. This may seem a bit harsh, but if my ticket says first class, I feel the product should be judged as an international first class standard. First class should feel overly indulgent, and I just didn't feel like I got that from TAG on this flight. Honestly, it compared to one of the lesser business classes of the world. I do want to say that with a caveat of sorts, however, because if we're being honest, I have to give them at least a little prop solely because Africa's aviation market is as volatile as any of them. Even with the petroleum money in Angola, it's very difficult to run an airline in that market. It sounds like they've had some recent financial success, and hopefully they can translate that into growth. If they grow within their means, there's no reason they can't become one of the big West African airlines. With this money, I could also see them continuing to better their products, both in the airport and on board. I will say that first class is a tough thing to perfect, but if you're gonna do it, you gotta do it right. I'd love to see TAG make this happen, but if they decide that that's not possible, I think they'd be better served by perfecting their business class instead. Make it so there's no need for a first class. We talk a lot about the value of products on this channel, whether or not the ticket is worth it, and with this one, I just can't say that it's worth double the cost of business class. I feel like other than some extra privacy on board, my experience was on par with a business class product, even though I was paying twice as much. Whatever the future holds for TAG, however, I really did enjoy being able to try out the only long haul first class in Africa while also knocking another country and airline off my list. Without a doubt, I will be back to try their new first class product. 
possibly once the new airport is finally open so I can see their new flagship product in its entirety. But let me know your thoughts on TAG, however, and until next Sunday, safe travels, and I'll see y'all next time.